and to study to show thyself approved unto God. Who are you wanting to show yourself approved to? Unto God. If you're approved unto God, you'll be approved by the right peers. If you're approved unto God, it doesn't matter who opposes you or disapproves of you. Make sure you're approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That word means confused, ashamed. A workman. And here, the word workman is talking about a farmer, one that tills the soil, one that grows fruit and vegetables, a workman that tills the ground, that wouldn't be ashamed. So we're a uh, hundred days into the class and we're 12 chapters deep. The book of Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. It's the book of beginnings. Everything for the next 65 books is prefigured in the first book of the Bible. Whether you go from Exodus to Revelation, you're going to find the fundamental principle in the book of Genesis. Half of the book of Genesis deals with the life of Joseph, a type of Jesus Christ. Before you get to chapter 12, you're dealing with how many covenants? First, the Edenic covenant. God made a covenant with Eden. The Adamic covenant. God made a covenant with Adam. The Noahic covenant. God made a covenant with Noah. After he gets off the ark and says, I will never again destroy the world with water. How Antichrist is our present environmental disposition in America. Environmentalism, the state of Washington in the next eight years will be 100% combustible engine free. You have to have an electric vehicle. Because we're melting the ice caps and the world is going to flood. It is anti-Christ. It's against the Bible. God made a covenant with Noah that I will never again destroy the world with water. This time I've reserved it under fire, under judgment. And this is how off base we are in our society because we've gotten away from the Word of God. So you have a covenant with Eden, a covenant with Adam, a covenant with Noah, and now Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is a brand new era. If there were to be a second book of Genesis, as in 1st and 2nd Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Corinthians, Timothy, this is where the second book of Genesis would begin. Because the call of Abraham is a brand new era. God started over. Up until this point, God deals universally with the entire human creation. Now God's going to deal with one man. Before the flood, there were two classes of people. Sethites and Cainites. Seth would have been the third-born son to Adam and Eve. Cain would have been <clears throat> the elder brother to Cain Seth. Two classes of people. Genesis 6 talks about them. When the Sethites, the sons of God, took wives unto the daughters of men, Cainites, the world became so wicked, the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Their imaginations were wicked. That God said, I will not always strive with man. And it repented the Lord that he made man. He destroyed the entire world except for eight souls. Noah, his wife, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and three daughters-in-law. The entire world at the Tower of Babel is dispersed by language. 
And those languages begin nationalities, at which point, Genesis 11 and 1, the whole earth, not just the whole earth, meaning seven continents, the whole earth, was Pangaea. It was one solid land mass. And in Genesis 11 and 18, the earth was divided into seven parts. Peleg, division. And that's how the earth was scattered abroad with inhabitants. All right? Which brings us to the last three verses in the book of Genesis chapter 11. Abram's father should have been the man that God called to go out to Canaan. He went so far, one of his sons dies. And he never gets over the loss of his child. His name is Terah. That means he delayed and died in his delay. He never learned how to bury dead yesterdays. He never learned how to get over grudges and painful recollections of his past. So he dies that day and never goes any further. Some people never get over their past hurts and failures. You know when you, there are people that are hating individuals who are dead and in their grave, that doesn't affect them. It only affects you. Divorcees, family breakups, job breakups, church breakups. When you allow bitterness to harbor in here, it's like drinking a poison hoping it'll kill your enemy. It only hurts you. People are walking around hating me that I don't even know exists. It doesn't affect me. It affects that individual. It will Get the best of you sooner or later. Mentally, physically, spiritually, in all aspects of your life, it's going to come out. Bitterness. You can, they wear it on their faces. Grudges. Vengeance. That's what Abram's father represented. He never could get over his past failures, and he stops living that day. So God says, let me start over with Abram. And the Abrahamic covenant has seven promises. Chapter 12, 1 through 3, names them. I will bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. Thy name should be great. I'll make of thee a great nation. I, you will be a blessing. Seven things. And these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Seven promises from 12, 2, and 3. Now, this is important. When you get to 12 and 4 through 13 and 14, you're reading scriptures that never should have been written in the Bible. From Genesis 12 and 4 to Genesis 13 and 14 should have never been written. It's there. It's the most important verses in the Bible, of 31,102 verses, you can learn more from 12 and 4 to 13 and 14 about life, about obedience, about failure and success than any other story in the Bible. We find the answer... In chapter 12 and 1, Sister Yasmin, read. Pause. Get away from your kindred. Get away from your father's house. 12 and 4, Sister Yasmin. That's not right. He departed all right, but not like the Lord said to. Because the Bible said what? God said, get away from your kinfolk, get away from your father's house. 
Abraham puts two and two together. I'm 75 years old. I'm going to an untamed land that I know nothing about. I've got one foot in the grave and one on the banana peel. I could kick the bucket at any moment. I've got a young, beautiful wife, no children. So he did what? And Lot went with him. That's his nephew. The first step in Abram's disobedience was he took Lot with him. And from 12 and 4 through 13 and 14, there's a spiraling downward in the life of Abram. One, one disaster after the next. One misstep after the next. Let's look at it. So he departed. Lot went with him. And let's see what happened. Verse number 7 says he built an altar. Where did he build his altar? Verse number 8, Sister Burnett. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. Uh-huh. And pitched his West yep. and on the east. So, he builds his home and his altar between Beth El. El means God, E-L, Elohim. El is God. Beth always means house of. He builds his home halfway between the house of God and Ai, someplace in Palestine. He builds his house not all the way where God wants him to, but somewhere between the world and somewhere between where God wants him in a valley of indecisiveness. And God says, I've got to get his attention. So what does the Lord do? Verse 10, Sister Moke. Pause. God says, let me get his attention. Now he's taken lot with him, disobedience number one. He's built his altar and his home in the wrong place. One mistake leads to another mistake. How do I know my children were lying to me? Just keep asking them questions. <laughs> a liar has to have an impeccable memory, and their lies will catch up with them sooner or later. One mistake leads to another mistake. One misstep leads to another misstep, and you've got to keep on going in the wrong direction until you make a correction or you die, one or the other. So God says, let me send a famine, interpreted a disciplinary testing unto him. I'm going to discipline him with this famine. So what does he do when the famine comes? Verse 11, Sister Taylor. Um, and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt. I don't want you in Egypt. I just got you away from your heathen family of idolatry and paganism, now you're going to a worse place. And not only are you going to a worse place, you're taking your family with you. You're going down, but you're taking others down with you. You got your house in the wrong place, you're worshiping in the wrong place, you're taking people down the wrong road with you. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll go further in the wrong direction. Let's go to Egypt. What does he do when he gets to Egypt? This is sorry. Um, <clears throat> verse 12, Shante. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see you. Man, when they see you, you're awfully beautiful. They'll kill me because I'm your husband. So let's do this. I want you to lie for me. To save my life, tell them you're my sister. You see how one mistake leads to another mistake? It's going to catch up with you, Abraham. You took Lot with you. You built your home and altar in the wrong place. God's got a famine on you now. Now you're in Egypt, number four. Number five, not only are you a liar, you made your wife lie for you. Six. Who would want to be with a man that's ashamed to be called your husband? You see there? 
Disobedience brings cowardice. All right? So it, just like he said, it happened, 14. The woman is very fair. 15. The princes of Pharaoh saw her bring her into Pharaoh's house and gives, gives Abram a lot of money for it. Now, he's prostituted his wife out, and he's getting rich for it. He says, man, I got the best of both worlds here. 17, God says, another mistake. 17, Sister Emily. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house. You've already taken your nephew with you. You built your house in the wrong place. You're worshiping in the wrong place. God sent a famine on the land. You got your wife lying for you to save your hide. Now God, the Pharaoh has made you rich and the borrower servant to the lender. With the shekels come the shackles. That's why we don't take one dime from the government. <laughs> and here, here, God says, now I'm sending a plague on Egypt. Don't be surprised if it comes out that the inflation, which is about 8.5%, and the high murder rate, number five in the nation in Baton Rouge, would be because they've touched God's anointed, because they've come against His church. It's not coincidental. God plagued the house of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looks out his window and sees Abram sporting with Sarah and says, I see what's happened. I got another man's wife in my palace. But while, while she's in the palace, while she is in the palace, she picks up a handmaid, a woman by the name of Hagar, an Egyptian woman. You see how one mistake leads to another mistake? You see how big doors swing on little hinges? The whole world is in chaos today because of that one consummation and sexual act between Abraham and Hagar. They have a boy by the name of Ishmael. That's the father of the Muslim nations, the Palestinian nations. God says, here's what I'm going to do because of that. Their hand is going to be against every man in the world. Everybody's going to hate them, and they're going to hate everybody. He even calls them wild and untamed. That's what those relationships produce. Now, we're just trashing poor Abraham for a little while. Um, Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife. He took Lot with him, but there's strife now. God says, since you won't listen to me, let me talk to Lot. Verse 7, there was strife between the herdmen of Abram and Lot. And Abram says, let there be no strife, verse 8, between us. Verse number 9, uh, Sister Amber. Mm -hmm. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. Mm -hmm. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Yeah. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abram's finally put two and two together and says, I've got to get as far away from you as possible. Because I've been judged ever since I've disobeyed God and took you with me. If you go left, I'll go right. You go right, I'll go left. But we have to get away from one another because I'm in, dis, I'm in direct disobedience to God. And until I get in obedience and repent and turn from my wicked ways, I've already brought plagues on Egypt. I brought a famine on the land. I've got this woman that's not my wife. We're fixing to have a child. Trouble. I, my wife has lost faith and confidence in me. You get away from me as far as you can. So what does he do? Verse 10 is a pivotal verse in the Bible. They separated themselves one from another. 11. Pitched his tent towards Sodom. 12. 
13, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Watch the change in tone in verse 14. Brother Zane? And the Lord said under Abel. Mm-hmm. Read. And alter that... After that, Lot was separated from him. God hasn't talked to him since Genesis 12 and 3. God hadn't talked to Abram since Genesis 12 and 3. Now, since you've obeyed me, I'll start talking to you again. God hadn't talked to him. All of this chaos, all these bad decisions, taking Hagar and going to Egypt and famines and altars and houses... All of that was Abram's doing. God had nothing to do with any of that. And the second that he gets back in compliance with God's command, the Lord says, I'll talk to you again. But until you do, I'm not talking to you. I didn't leave you. You left me. Isn't that something? And he says, let me just show you what I have in store for you. Read. Read. After that Lot was separated from him, read, uh, Sister Joe. For all the land which thou uh, lift up now thine eyes, 14. 14. Yep, okay. 14, lift up now thine eyes. 14 and what? Uh, 13 and 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, yeah. lift up now thine eyes mm -hmm. and look. From the place where thou art. Neighbor. Pause. Pause. Now that you've obeyed God, now that you're in obedience with God, how far can you see from where you are? Hmm. Lift up now thine eyes and look. Now that you're where you need to be with God, how far can you see from where you are? Because everywhere that the soles of thy feet shall trod, to thee I will give it. If you'll stay in compliance and obedience, and submission to me, God said, I'll give you everywhere you walk. I will give you everything you ask for. Everywhere you go is going to be yours. The waters will part before you. The fire will come out of heaven. I'll devour your enemies. You'll possess the gates of your enemies. I'll make you wealthy. God says, you start walking and you determine your borders. Where you stop, I'll stop blessing you. If you'll keep going, I'll keep blessing you. The whole tone of Genesis changes in these verses right here. For all the land, 15, Brother Zane, 15. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed Pause. America is one with Israel, and any president or any senator, or anybody that tries to make a two-party state out of Israel, God says, I'm going to devour you, because this land is to you and your seed forever. Israel belongs to the Israelites, the Jews, not the Muslims, not Hagar's children, not the Ishmaelites. It belongs to the Jews, Isaac's seed. There'll never be a two-party state, ever. Never will be. And God says anybody, I mean, Israel represents less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population, but they have the strongest, fiercest military on earth. And anybody that fights against them, they devour them because they're in covenant with God. That's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's Israel. Thy seed forever. There can never be a two-party state, and you cannot coexist. This is, belongs to God's people, only God's people. Um, I make thy seed as the dust of the earth. If you can number it, so shall thy seed be numbered. 17, Brother Zane. Breadth of it, yep. Mm -hmm. Mamre, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the right place. Now you're doing right. 
uh, verse 14 talks about a war because of where Lot is. Lot gets kidnapped. Abram's got to go to war. Let's see. 17 is one of the most... Uh, 17, 18, and 19. Let's find out about this individual. Who is Melchizedek? Who is Melchizedek? Uh, go with that, uh, Sister Yasmin. Yeah, verse 17. 14 and 17. 14, 17. Yep. After he performed for the slaughter of Cater Lamar and the kings, yep. And of the kings that were with him at the valley of Eden, which is the king there. 18. Yep. King of Salem brought four bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Uh huh. God, yep. possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God which had delivered thy enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. All right, before tithing, whatever be taught is a law. So people that would say tithing should have ended with the law, they're, in, they're scripturally in error because tithing predates the law. It predates the law, which was given by Moses in Exodus 20, before there was a law given. And it goes past the law in the New Testament. So tithing is your obligation to God. You move 10 out, God blesses the 90, and he makes the 90 go further than the 100. It's God's. It's holy and sanctified. That means it's set apart by him and for him. All right. Uh, so who is Melchizedek? Before I tell you, read 23. Uh, 23, Sister Taylor. 23. That I will not take from a thread, even from a shoe latchet, yep. that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Pause. The borrower is servant to the lender. You hear about these churches that took $40 million of PPP money, payroll protection? You hear about these churches that took $11 million? What about 17 and 23? I'm not taking from a thread or a shoe latchet from you because you can't say you made me rich. You can't say you put one dime into this church government. That's a slippery slope because if they can give it to you, they can take it from you. And once they give it to you, you are there Employee, same-sex marriages, you've got to perform that. Abortion, you can't preach against that. The borrower is servant of a lender. God said, Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything. I don't want you to be tied to anything, preacher, or anybody that will keep you from telling the truth and cause people to be lost. Don't take a thread to a shoe latchet from them. They will say, I made you. God says, I don't want that. And Abram is at the spoils of the battle, and he says, I don't want the spoils of the battle. You're not going to say you made me rich. Everything that is good in my life came from God. All that I am and all that I hope to be, I owe to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if I'm successful, to God be the glory. If I have something nice, to God be the glory. If, if we're talented, if we have abilities, to God be the glory. What dost thou have that thou didst not receive? If thou didst receive it, wherefore boastest thou that thou receivest it not? Why are you bragging like you're something when if God with one snap of the fingers can take everything from you? And I wouldn't want God to have to humble me because I got too big for my shoes or britches and says, look what I have done. God said, is that right? Nebuchadnezzar did that. 
And God's Nebuchadnezzar look, said, look at what I have done. Look at Babylon. It was the seven wonder of the world. And God said, is that right? So at that moment, God drove him from the presence of man. Bird's claws grew out of his fingers and toes. Eagle's feathers grew out of his back. He was in an animal position like an ox, eating grass and licking dew from the earth. God gave him a beast heart. A lot of people in our world have hearts of a beast today. You hear me talking about those MAPs, minor attracted persons? You can't use pedophile anymore. Pedophile is offensive. And this person identifies as a minor attracted person. And it's no longer a criminal act. Oh, that's not happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's happening in the USA. The heart of a beast. When you murder 60 million babies, what do you think you're going to turn into? When, when, when Hollywood produces murder and crime and cannibalism, what do you think we're going to turn into? What is Disney doing? What do you think we're going to turn into? We've got to shape the minds of the children. All right. Uh, so I wanted to tell you who Melchizedek was. Go to Hebrews. Let's leave Genesis for a moment. The book of Hebrews, everybody. The first Jewish Christian epistle. Hebrews number 7. Hebrews 7 and 3. Page 1296. Hebrews 7 and 3. Page 1296, Old Schofield. Hebrews 7 and 3. This is really going to be interesting to y'all. Mm-hmm. Sister Emily, go. Who is Melchizedek? Read. Said, what verse is Seven and three. Okay. Without father, without mother. Melchizedek didn't have a father or mother. Read. Without descent. He didn't have descent. Yep. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. He didn't begin and he never ends. But like unto the Son of God. He was the Son of God. In the Old Testament... In the Old Testament, there are, uh, as a priest, he abideth as a priest continually. In the Old Testament, there are many divine appearances of God. Who is spirit? John 4, 24. Spirit meaning pneuma, breath. You can't see it. But in the Old Testament, there are many divine appearances of God in human form. He appears as a man. His name was Melchizedek. God himself. He appears again in a few verses, chapters, on the plains of Mamre. A, a person in human form appears to Abram and talks with him. And it was God himself that took on the form of a man. He does it again to Jacob. He wrestles with Jacob. And Jacob says, what is thy name? He never would tell him, but when the fight is over, he said, I just saw God face to face. Theophany is the term. Theo, God, Ophany, a divine appearance of God in the form of a human being. That's who Melchizedek was. He, he had no beginning, he had no ending, no father, no mother, no end, no beginning. He was the son of God. All right, so I wanted you all to know that. Going, going back to Genesis number, question. How, how many years does Melchizedek appear in Scripture? Over, over the course of what timeline? Uh, that would be, so, in Genesis number uh, 13, 17, we don't hear about him again. We, he's the king of Salem. Salem, peace. Jeru Salem, the city of peace. He was the king of the city of peace, of heaven. That was the earthly Jerusalem is type of heaven. So he appears here and disappears as quickly. We never hear about him again until you get to the book of Hebrews. Now we're going to see somebody. Pause and go to chapter number 18. Yeah, Genesis 18, 1 and 2, and you can read. 
Watch this. Genesis 18, 1, 2. Go ahead. Okay. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre uh -huh. while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men Pause. Were 18 and 1. The Lord. Capital letters. L-O-R-D. Jehovah God. Elohim. Not lowercase Lord, which means master, or capital L-O-R-D. This is Jehovah God appears to him, and Abram lifts up his eyes, and he sees three men. God himself, who dispatches after this conversation, two men to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And they get to Lot's house and says, get out of here. The Lord will destroy this city. This is another theophany of God. It doesn't call him Melchizedek, but the reason his name was there, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or the king of peace, Isaiah 9 and 6, the prince of peace. <coughs> Lord of lords, king of kings, prince of peace, Isaiah 9 and 6. You see this throughout the word of God. And... Watch this one. Genesis, question. Okay, so it's not God's call by so many different mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. So in the scriptures that we just read, he was called Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. So it's he is a theophany. Theophany. Okay. So a theo is God, fanny, a divine appearance. Theophany. Okay. And. What is that? That is the divine appearance of God in human form in the Old Testament before His incarnation. Now, as we're fixing to see here, I want to tell you something. Jesus is innumerable what's, but one who. He's one who. He's Jesus. He's Jesus. That's His name. It's always been His name. Jesus, Jehovah Savior. He's innumerable what's, but he's one who? What is he? Creator? He is healer, provider, warrior. All throughout the Word of God. He's innumerable what's. Those are not different gods. There's one God. With no distinction of persons, Jesus is his name. So, you say, well, do I call him Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shalom, whatever you want to call him, those are titles, innumerable what's, but one who. Jesus is his name. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him. You are what you are when you're all by yourself. There wrestled a what with him? There wrestled a what with him? A man. A man wrestled with Jacob. 30. Read. 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. The man was God, and Jacob's been wrestling with him face to face. <coughs> Divine appearance of God in human form in the Old Testament. Not another God, not a different God. Just divine appearance of God. Isn't that something? And we see this throughout the Word of God. Well, you say, well, I wish I could see it. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. When He fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you are made in His image and after His likeness. And the more like Him you become with His Spirit dwelling in you, Every time you look in the mirror, you should see a reflection. Is this what God looks like? Do I pray for my enemies? Do I do good to them to despitefully use me? The more, that's what Christian, follower of Jesus Christ. I want to be more like him. Less of me and more of you. So the love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It means you can't love this world that is hateful and murderous and, and vitriol and say you love God. Racism, division, prejudices. How do you say you love him whom you have never seen, but can't love your brother whom you have seen? Everybody with me so far? So the more like him you become, the more like him you'll become. In unity with him. In fellowship with him. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another. All right, uh, question. Yep. Okay. You made the statement that when God gives you something, mm -hmm. you not take it back. And so the, I thank you for mm -hmm. meaning that He gives you the Holy Ghost. God yes. Don't take that back. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? So, the Bible says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gifts, the Holy Ghost is a gift. Tongues, interpretation, healing, miracles, knowledge, wisdom, faith, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. There's 32 New Testament gifts. The gifts, the Holy Ghost, and the calling, God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, are without repentance. God won't change his mind on that. He's settled on who you are. He called you out into something and he won't ever take that back from you he's not an i know we got indians watching but he's not an indian giver <laughs> in other words he won't go back on his word that means there are people that are backslidden who have the call to preach minister sing whitney houston got her talent from god she started singing in church, choirs, solos, moving people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then look where it winds up. But God won't take his anointing from you. That's why she had the power to move millions of people with her vocal abilities that God gave her more than anybody else. More than anybody else. God says, I have blessed you with that gift to be a blessing to me and my kingdom. But he won't take it back. It don't matter how far off track you get. Balaam had the gift of prophecy. And God gave him that gift and God didn't take it back even when he used his prophecy to gain money and to curse God's people. The prodigal son is the father's son. He's been given an inheritance. The father says it's yours. He goes and spends everything in the nightclubs. Wastes it all. He winds up in the hog pen. He would have feigned to fill his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And he came to himself. He's still the father's son in the hog pen. High on meth and crack and drinking booze and womanizing, doing everything you're big enough to do. God won't take his Holy Ghost back from you. You're not acting like a son. You're not behaving like you have a gift. But it's still in you. And Paul says, I've got to lay my hands on you and stir up the gift that is in you. And you have to exercise those gifts to keep them active. So you need to be stirring them up. You need to keep them active, never dormant. You've got to use them. Five talents, he wants you to make ten of them. Two talents, he wants you to make four of them. If you sit on your talent, God says... You, you hide it in the earth and bury it. I'm going to take from him that hath not and give to him that hath. Those are talents and, and it's representative of what God has entrusted to you. My point in the gifts and calling of God are without repentance is, I called you, Abraham. Go to where I want you to go. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to chastise you. There's going to be famine and plagues. But... I'm not going to take back my calling from you. I'm expecting you to do what I told you to do. And I want you to do it so bad, I love you, so I chasten you. 
If we be without chastisement, Hebrews 12, 8, we're bastards and not sons. I, I, I love you, so I correct you to get you back where I want you to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Your Holy Ghost is not stirred up yep. before you die and you are what away is, from God. You didn't come back like the Father and came back. Luke 15. Here's your answer. Luke 15, page 1097. Luke 15. Uh, 25, 26. Luke 15, 25, 26, Sister Almira, page 1097. Here's what happens. This is the answer to her question. What if he doesn't come back? Read before he dies. Now his eldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Mm -hmm. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What does this mean? So there's going to be a party. There's going to be music, there's going to be dancing, there's going to be a trumpet of God that sounds. If you don't come back to the Father's house, the party's going to start without you. The music's going to play without you. The trumpet's going to sound and your ear won't be tuned to the sound of the trumpet. Because not everybody's going to leave this ground when the trumpet sounds. The dead in Christ shall rise first. The rest of the dead live not again for a thousand years. Your ears got to be tuned. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, two is going to be in the field, one should be taken, one should be left. Your ears not tuned for the sound of a trumpet, meaning when the trumpet sounds, we're getting out of here. Two should be in the be uh, bed, one taken, one left. Now, I hope that answers your question. You got to get back to where you're supposed to be. And that's why the scripture said, who knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. Hell's hot and it's for eternity. So we evangelize, we run buses, we preach, we teach, we, we preach soul-stirring messages every service. We never close a service without an altar call and a water call because I'm persuading you, don't die lost. Don't miss the rapture. Make your calling and election sure. We're waking people up. Who knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. That's what evangelism is. To give the gospel to those that are lost. You're wandering in darkness. You're blind right now. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, somebody found me. I once was blind, now I can see. That's all anybody needs. They just need the scales to come off of their eyes so they can see the light. Say, well, I'm glad I found the Lord. Wrong. He never was lost. You were lost. He found you. Somewhere a sermon found you. A song found you. A scripture found you. He woke you up and called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um... So I hope that helps you. Genesis number 17. Watch this. Did we leave 17 yet? Genesis 17 and 15. That's uh, we got Sarai 16. She was barren. Listen, this is important. All of the patriarchs' wives were barren women because the patriarchs were types of Jesus. That means they represent Jesus and their wives represent the church. Adam was a type of Jesus. Eve was a type of the church. Adam was the son of God. Adam went to sleep and from his side came a rib and produced a woman. Jesus slept on the cross and from his side when the sword pierced it out forth came blood and water and it purchased the church the bride of Christ Abraham was a type of Jesus Sarah was a type of the bride Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ hated by his brethren 
And when his brethren hate him, they cast him out, and he takes a what? A Gentile wife. Because his own brethren don't accept him. And Jesus said, I came to my own, the Jews, but the Jews didn't receive me, so I took a Gentile wife. That's where we fit in. Throughout the Word of God, all the wives of the patriarchs were barren because God says anything that's produced in the type of the church is going to be not through man, but through God. I don't want you to be able to produce anything because I don't want any flesh glorying in my presence. I want to get all the glory in the church. If somebody gets a miracle, I can't stand up and say, look what I did. I laid hands on them and, and I anointed them and, and I killed that cancer. You're a fool. Um, T.W. Barnes was a, he was used in the gifts of miracles and healings. And he was big time. I mean, emptying wheelchairs and cancers and were being healed through the laying on of his hands. And they said, his organization, the UPC, says, we're going to put up a huge crusade. We're going to compete with Oral Roberts and A.A. A. Allen. And they put on their T.W. Barnes healing crusade. And he was passing by on the road, and he saw it, and his chest poked out. And he picked his head up, and he said, look at me. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, hope you have good church tonight, because I'm not going to be with you. If it's about you, I won't be there. He spun around and went to that tent and he told the organization, pull that sign down. He said, it ain't about me. This is a God healing crusade. If you don't get rid of that sign, God won't show up tonight. Everybody with me so far? It's not about me. It's about God. Any gift that God gives to the church is to glorify the giver, not the recipient. Singing is to glorify him, not the singer. Preaching is to glorify him, not the preacher. Anointed exhortation, healing, signs and wonders, knowledge, wisdom, prophecy. The gift is a revelation of the giver, not the recipient. And anything we're doing... It's supposed to glorify God, not us. Never us. It's not about us. We're not on show. Jesus is on show here tonight. Jesus is on show on this. That's why we put our best foot forward in worship and in praise and in a presentation of the gospel, lest we clothe the riches of Christ in rags. What are you doing operating in fear? God's not a God of fear. Take that mask off. Quit bowing down to the governor like a lap dog. What's the matter with you? You're clothing the riches of Christ in rags. Oh, please, Mr. Governor, can I baptize somebody? You're a disgrace to the gospel. What is the matter with you? Okay? That is not who God is. He went into the temple and overturned the money changers' tables and drove them out with a whip, said, you made this a den of thieves. This is a house of prayer. And when the, when the governor says, I'm going to kill you, he said, you go tell that fox I'll be here today, tomorrow, and the next day. If you want me, come get me. But you can't touch me until my time is on earth is done. That's what God wants is boldness. Oh, he disrespects dignitaries. Who's dignitary? Anybody that promotes same-sex marriage and murders babies is not a dignitary. It's not. No respect for that at all. And anybody that appeases them, no, nope, can't stomach that. Not and be God's person. All right. I think we're over time. <laughs> not yet? We ought to be. I'm sweating in here. Y'all got me so hot. We got to take an offering. All right, God bless your word tonight. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl in this Bible class. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. Ever, ultimately, we want to give you glory, honor, and power. In Jesus' name we pray it. And everybody said? Amen. Be sure to have your cat spayed and neutered. <laughs>